Have we got any questions? <clears throat> Oops, lots of hands. Person in the blue. Yep. Yep. Well, it is a CTC survey data, but the Victorian data uses a similar data uh, risk and protective factor profile. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, John might be better answered the, the actual. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the benefit of having one instrument, and uh, I think the government can get that, and they're they're quite keen to. I think if you're trying to do community work, it's very hard if you can't compare apples with apples, yeah. and that's the benefit. The other thing is that, um, as uh, um, it was said on the video, that it's been carefully selected set of questions that are being asked because they are valid and they've been shown um, through long-term studies that they do predict outcomes for children. And that's why we sort of now treat them as very important bits of information, each of them. And how, how large was the data set? Uh, for the stat comparisons, each of those data points is 10,000 uh, children. For the year sevens, that would be about 3,500 children in each. So it's, <coughs> it's representative a, of Victoria Quite case. narrow confidence yeah. intervals on those uh, as a result. And it, it, so too in Mornington, they had, they've got quite a populous um, group of kids there and that would be about 900 kids in, in each of those surveys. So almost a total sample of the, um, the year nine, uh, year seven group. They also had similar data for year nine and 11. Gentleman at the back here. Uh, welcome back, John. Uh, I reckon that the majority of your most at risk cohort will not be able to read that survey. I also reckon that the majority of your most at-risk cohort are no longer regularly attending school by year 10. Two, two answers yeah, to that, yeah. So firstly, um, for the, that's, uh, if you believe that the community is in a state where that's occurring, which many communities have to realise that, uh, there's a read aloud version, and um, we have been doing that with, we don't take it to any younger than grade five, but we do recommend if there is a concern that um, kids are on a, uh, ha having trouble um, through the development path, and you know it's going to be an early problem, it's better to start <laughs> early. And the read aloud version in grade five enables all the children who are at school to complete the study. Um, the, the survey uh, obviously needs to be complemented with every other piece of data you have. So we encourage, that obviously what you're looking for is a good match with what the young people are saying to the results of your um, early development index data to other data that you've got that can inform what mums are doing. Um, the, uh, the, the fact that you don't have, if you have large populations who are not at school and you want to know what's going on, then it's good to do additional work. Um, some communities run focus groups with kids that are not at school, and uh, what you're trying to do is to just make sure that you do, you do uh, again, you, as a community, you have to own this, and so one of the problems there for Francis is he's gonna have to be sure that in the end, the, 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 there aren't any questions left where people say, sorry, I'm not convinced by the year 10 results, you need to do something extra. If, they, if people are saying that, then we do need to jump around and do extra. But in the end, it's a community process and we want to make sure that we've ticked all the boxes so people are confident that that is the story for year 10. And if there's a group who are out of school, activities have to be run to make sure they're getting their say. So it's, uh, uh, whilst we're presenting the, um, the, 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 the student data that many communities wish to have forums and involve youth and reach out and find out the, the picture from other pieces of information. So, so are you, are you saying only. some of the kids who are at school won't be able to read? Is that Absolutely. one of the... Yeah. 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 And that's the read aloud. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, I wasn't sure if you were saying they wouldn't be there. I'm talking about year 10, <coughs> not, not, not grade 5. No. 
Yeah. And I'd also really like you to include some of our fabulous young people who packed our theatre here for the Youth Achievement Awards uh, just this last week uh, on your board. It seems to be a very adult board. Where are the young people involved? Yeah. Well, can I just mention that uh, every board does have a youth board, and um, uh, so it's a Mornington, uh, Mornington Peninsula has a strong youth youth board uh, as part of it. And um, again, it's, a, it's something that you need to have so that you're very comfortable with the way that you do business in Warrnambool. I'm sure that the other thing I'll say is that I would expect no less than the result as it finally emerges in Warrnambool is going to be one that um, will put to shame all of the previous work that's been done. So, you know, we're, we have great expectations. If I can add to that, in addition to the four high schools and so far, um, 10 of the 12 primary schools. We're also doing the survey at the WAVE School and the VCAL program at TAFE. So we'll pick up a lot of them. And Brophy, as an organisation, is in touch with many of the young people at risk of homelessness. Um, I'll just ask that for posterity, if you can wait until I can get a microphone to you to ask. Any other questions at this stage? Yep, it's one over there. Uh, the framework you're putting together here seems quite adaptable to the community. I'm just yeah. wondering if the intention is also that when you start addressing risk and protective factors, that you'll be able to apply that on the individual level to their families and to the schools as well, so you address all of those risk and protective factors. So I'm not sure what your question is. So you, you identify them? Yeah, yeah, this seems like a community framework. Is the intention that it, that will still go down, knuckle down and focus on the individual, their families and the particular school yeah, that they so, go to? So the, the risk factors are measuring risk factors in those domains and then the evidence-based strategies will target the, the, whatever the domain is. So if it's a family risk factor, it will target the family. If it's an individual risk factor, it will target the individual the strategy that's targeting that. <clears throat> Check, but you only survey students, you don't survey staff or parents? No, I don't think we... That, that's not in the history of CDC, is it, John? Uh, the, this, with the... Um, sorry. Uh, yeah. So, the, with the, uh, the... The key data that we're trying to bring to the table is a, a, a student survey. Um, but other communities have decided to uh, have other information that they collect. And obviously the, with the Australian Early Development Index that you, your community would have data there, that the teachers are reporting on uh, at early primary school on the readiness of the children as they enter school. And if you have a wish that you think that there needs to be um, additional data collection, for example, there are uh, evidence-based instruments that parents can complete, and we're, we're happy to work with you on that. Uh, again, there's no um, end to the amount of data. We, we think it should be uh, as much as possible. But the, the youth survey is, uh, as I said earlier, it's, the, it's a very strong indicator of um, what's going to happen next in your community. And it's been missing uh, up until this type of work. So it's very important. That's the central thing we're trying to add to the other p bits and pieces that you, know, you might need. Now... Any other questions? Well, I'm glad it's clear. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, there's one more there. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm from the neighbourhood. Yeah, just take the microphone so others can hear you. Um, and, and this is, like, I, I like the concept of all this. The thing that I'm thinking of with the data, if you're doing it all through the schools, you have schools that come from other LGAs that go to the schools in Warrnambool, other yeah, students. Yeah, kids that come from other yeah. LGAs, yeah. So yeah. I'm just wondering how that, how that sort of impacts or what goes on with that, if risk factors are seen to be for certain students that come from outside Warrnambool. What sort of proportion are you looking at when you talk um, about that? I'm not sure, because, yeah... But I do know it does exist. I know a lot of students from Moyne definitely come Warrnambool Way and also from Karangamite, some come this way as well. It's not, it's not a problem we haven't faced before. We do face that in some of the LGAs in Melbourne where there are students travelling in. Um, I, yeah, well, I'll let you talk about it then. But the, the, we, do, we do track kids in terms of postcodes and we do map <laughs> things in terms of regions. And there are ways of managing that. 
Um, if, 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 if there are, I, I would imagine in terms of sort of representative samples, if they're not too much, too many of them, it probably won't make that much of a difference in terms of looking at your profile for that community, but it depends on how many there are. But there are ways of managing those sorts of things. Uh, so with the um, Mornington Peninsula Shire, they initially, they did a lot of work when they first surveyed to try to work out what are the communities that young people are, um, perceive in Mornington Peninsula Shire. So it helped them to work out that they've got six communities in terms of the way young people uh, move around and much of them are attached to the transport areas that the young people attend school in. So we, we ask about postcode and that uh, there are many postcodes in um, the uh, Mornington Peninsula but there's, it's also possible to ask which, which street are you living near, which street corner and we've got that potential in the online survey. So the, the data is quite flexible and um, can be cut up in different ways to analyse the questions that you as a community uh, have. And they're sort of crosses and checks that we have for, you know, for checking things out and you would have seen in the video we check sort of honesty levels, we check whether they're located in the area. So there's, all, there's, a, there's a whole lot of built-in things around those sorts of things. <clears throat> Oh, she's got her own microphone. I have got my own well, microphone. Well, you must be the chair. You're in my <laughs> theatre. <laughs> um, I'd just like to say that um, you'll see on the stand there that this is endorsed by Beyond the Bell. Yeah. And mm. so um, we would hope that if we get any data about Moyne students that is significantly large enough sample, that we'll be able to pass that on to the Moyne Beyond the Bell local action group so that they can respond um, because this is... Um, communities that care, the way we see it is it's one of the activities of the wider effort round Beyond the Bell. So hopefully you've all heard of Beyond the Bell, um, our Great South Coast um, project focusing on um, improving children's um, educational attainment. And um, we're very, and in fact in Warrnambool the local action group will become um, the board for communities that care. That's, we after this session we're actually having our, our training. So there's lots of further conversations to have here um, but um, a significant part of the approach we're taking with Beyond the Bell is an approach called collective impact very focused on shared measurement and data mm. so we would want to make sure that that data is shared with our peers across the region as well. All right I think on that note, Cameron. We might move. I have a very brief presentation and that's just to really prompt an update on what's happened so far locally and what our plans are. So I'll move into that. And after that, I'll bring John and Bosco up to the table and we'll see if there's any more discussion. So you'll recall from the five stages, um, the first is, is get ready. We've assessed that Warnable is ready for a prevention campaign and that's largely due to the work that Beyond the Bell has done over the last couple of years. Um, there is such a strong alignment between the two programs that, as Vicky mentioned, the local action group for Beyond the Bell is also functioning as the Communities That Care Board. Um, their, their overlap in terms of uh, scope, um, geographic, and also the fact that it is addressing the full developmental, um, developmental spectrum from birth right through to adulthood. Um, so in, in a way we're really building on and reinforcing the momentum that's been achieved through Beyond the Bell. So locally 
where we're up to is really at the beginning. We've formed the board and we've started arrangements for the, the schools. That needs to be finalised. There is still some issues to sort out around um, whether passive consent is allowable. We're just waiting on the outcome of an ethics application to the Department of Education and Training for, for the public schools to permit pa uh, passive consent, which means that whole classes will be surveyed instead of just the few that happen to manage to get the consent form back. So then we'll be moving into the next stage, which is building the community profile. And it, there's two components in that. First is the outcomes and uh, analysis of the youth survey. That will give us a picture of, a local picture of what are the, the levels of prevalence of each of the risk factors and protective factors. So that will give us an idea then we can have the discussion as a community, where do we want to target? Where are we going to focus? Out of the however many, 20 or more, we might pick two or five risk factors to really hone in on. And then uh, also in the community profile will be a database or a listing of all of the existing programs that are being run in schools, in the community, that are set up to address child and adolescent health or address issues of uh, alcohol and drug abuse or dropping out of school. So that, that will be the next sort of main outcome from the project. It will be a document um, that organisations and the community as a whole will be able to use as a tool for further planning. After that, on the basis of that community profile, we'll develop a social development strategy. Now, in that, we'll include the evidence-informed strategies that we've selected that have been proved or demonstrated um, to work elsewhere to address our priority factors. So that will then be used to uh, support funding applications. It may be the case that there's already a lot of good work being done, evidence-informed programs been run for years that are effective. So this is not about throwing everything out, starting from scratch. We pick those up, we identify them, and it will be to support and reinforce uh, to, to get continuity of funding, additional funding for what is already working. Or it may be that through this process we determine there are in fact gaps for our high risk factors for this local community that are not being adequ adequately addressed, then we can start thinking about what do we need to bring in and adapt to our local environment um, where there's been evaluation that it's worked elsewhere. Um, so what, what is the problem? What, why do you even think about doing something like this? Well, one of the primary imperatives for this program, as it is with Beyond the Bell, is high school attainment. We have embarrassingly low, troublingly low levels of attainment for year 12 or equivalent. So that might be a certificate two or three, could be a vocal, or could be a VC year 12. We are very, very much below the state average, and in fact, even below the average for other rural areas in Victoria. And that has serious consequences for those individuals who don't complete um, a year 12 or equivalent, because that is a predictor for um, poor social development and lower uh, income, the struggle to get work. It's also a problem for the community as a whole, because if we're to move forward and prosper as a regional centre, we're going to need a workforce with skills. And one of the, one of the anchors that will be dragging us back from that um, prosperity and economic development will be skill shortages. So we're going to need these young people go right through, get a trade, get qualified, or at least get to year 12, 
so that then they can become the next wave of productive citizens. So however you look at it, whether you look at it from a broad picture, sociological, economic perspective, or whether you look at it from the individual lives of these young people, we really need to move on this. Um, there's a lot of attention around um, ice and, and other drugs, but still, the, in terms of all the statistics, hospital admissions, health problems, social problems, alcohol and alcohol consumption at dangerous levels is still the forefront of the, of the problem from a public health perspective, followed by tobacco. So these things, it's not been without effort. I mean, we haven't ignored the problem, but whatever we have been doing has been insufficient. And in this area, we still uh, consume alcohol at uh, dangerous rates higher than the state average. Um, Antisocial behaviour, delinquency, um, is a problem. I mean, it, it affects not just those individuals, because they then get a criminal record, then they have struggle to get work, but it also impacts on um, the whole of the community. Another factor is the early initiation of sex, or which has um, problem outcomes like teen pregnancy or high rates of sexually transmitted infection. These are also predictors of, um, or it's a, it's a serious a serious problem. And use of um, illicit drugs. So that's the. This is why we're embarking on this journey. So some of this overlaps and reinforces what Bosco mentioned. These behaviours are have a tendency to be predicted by certain risk factors. Now this is not um, a comprehensive list, but they tend to fall into. We've structured it so it falls into a number of domains. In the family domain, things like uh, poor family management or a history of conflict, um, parental attitudes are all indicative of future um, drug taking and antisocial behaviour. So you notice some of these things you can do something about and others you can't. There's nothing you can do about a history of family conflict. That's in the past. So a lot of the, some of these risk factors are malleable in other words, you can, there are interventions that you can help shift them and other things are, are fixed that, will, that you can't really change. So obviously, if we have limited resources, we want to target those interventions with those factors that, that are more malleable. In, um, at the school, um, as was covered in the video from the five towns, communities that care, the level of commitment to school is also um, a, risk, a risk factor. In the community, I mean, if you have a junior sporting game and the parents are around the outside cheering on with a drink in their hand, these are social norms that tend to set up and influence outcomes. Bosco covered a lot of these in his presentation, so I'll move more quickly through this. The fourth domain is at the individual and peer level. Uh, again, some of these things are fixed or innate to the, per to the individual. Um, other things that you, you can do something about. Similarly with protective factors. So these are things which, even though there may be risks in pl uh, risk factors in place, they tend to buffer and counter the influence of risk factors. It's interesting, there's, from the studies that have been done consistently, there are five things which have a tendency to, to make a difference with protective factors. So if individuals are given the opportunity to get involved in something meaningful, uh, contribute in some way, if they are given the skills to be able to successfully engage in that activity, and if there are, um, if 
that tends to create um, a good bonding with the organisation and the responsible adults involved. Um, if there is recognition and acknowledgement of the efforts and the achievements of those individuals, where there's um, individual differences, every child is different, their characteristics take, taken into account, that has a tendency to um, influence the positive trajectory of behaviour. Um, the other, the fifth critical aspect is that there are clear standards of behaviour. Where those things are in place in a program, research has documented that they tend to have a positive impact. So some of the protective factors are similar across the, the, the domains. The opportunities for pro-social involvement, recognition and acknowledgement of that involvement. Um, social skills is something you can do something about. Um, some of these other things are, are more difficult. Okay, so what, what do we do about it? When I've been asked, so what programs are you going to deliver? And I say I have absolutely no idea. Um, I mean, there are a lot of good programs out there, but we're not going to preempt the the outcome of the the data and the the community profile. But we can say some things in general about the things that we would anticipate that would come out of the social development strategy. So, in the there are family focused programs, prenatal and infancy and early childhood support is is critical. It's what's been found is the trajectory of an individual's life is set fairly early and the longer it goes, the more difficult it is to change that trajectory. It's not impossible, but the earlier on the intervention, the more successful it's likely to be. Um, in, uh, in the schools, there's already a lot of good work going on. We will work with the schools to support that work and where there's interest, um, support the introduction of additional programs. And at the community-wide level, I mean, there was a seminar recently about the Good Sports Program. It's not about starting from scratch, reinventing the wheel. It's about working out w where to um, build, and build on and support existing programs. So that's it for me. So we've got about a year and a half to go, nearly two years. The next stage will be a community profile that will include the outcomes of the survey and a list of all the programs that are in place. That will be followed by the social development strategy, which will include all of the evidence-informed programs that we're recommending for Warrnambool that will address our local priority factors. Um, before I ask for questions, I might get Bosco and John up to the panel and then we can, um, you can direct the questions to whoever's the most appropriate. Right, thank you very much. We have a here on each side to run the mics. <coughs> Thanks, Kylie. Get you ready. Um, just on the um, board that's been selected, I know it's the Beyond the Bell board, that's a pre-existing board that is, um, from my understanding, predominantly made up of um, educational um, background people. Um, from watching the video on the Five Town, there was there was a pastor, there was a small business owner, and probably other people. Um, is is there a concern that there might not be a good cross section of the community on? this board because it's already made up of, of a pre-existing one? Um, so, uh, good question. And yes, that has been identified. The board includes a very broad cross-representation of um, school principals, the Department of Education and Training, Department of Human Services, um, the council, 
I'm not sure the, the LEN may have been on it. But in addition to that, Brophy is on it, the Wave School. Um, who have I neglected to include? Yes, the um, Southwest Healthcare, Deakin University, TAFE. So you are correct that it is timely to reflect on the makeup of that board, um, both for Beyond the Bell, Warnable Local Action Group, and also communities that care, and identify where the gaps are, and then invite people in. There's also these key leader roles. So they're not people that meet every month, but are people who are in positions of influence, um, who are able to, in, as they go about the course of their work, promote and um, connect with their spheres and feedback into the, into the board. I have a quick question. Um, how often will our local data be collected? Uh, is it a one-off survey for, and then it, in every couple of years? How do you see the um, data being? Uh, for the, the, the present um, funding support enables the data to be collected. There'll be two, two, two surveys, so you'll be able to do the survey and then an outcome. And as Bosco said, they'll be separated by two years, roughly. So it'll be, I think, uh, depending on where it starts, it might be actually um, increased towards two and a half or even three years. Uh, so again, will be flexibility there is you don't want to do your second measurement until such time as you feel like the plan has had time to work. And so we'll be, uh, there, there are a little bit of, there will be a bit of flexibility there for that bit. Yep, so it'll be like a pre and post, pre-intervention, implement the intervention post-intervention. So we'd like to see changes in the direction that we're looking for after the intervention's had time to um, um, have an effect. And of, of course, uh, I suppose in the future, as a community, you can think about, like Mornington has done, um, doing ongoing surveying and monitoring what's going on. So over time, seeing you know, trajectory changes. I would think being longitudinal, we'd have to try and get funding over as many years as possible would be the, um, the best outcome. Yeah. You want to do that efficiently, you don't want to do it too often, no. but you want to do it often enough. Yes. Yeah. Just on that issue, what I will raise there is something that we um, are thinking a lot about is that Bosco mentioned that prevention has an economic return. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, we're, we're very conscious of the fact that there are um, outcomes for children, I mean, I think people have said it in this forum that we're not, we, we want better for our children than we're getting at the moment. Uh, it's very expensive to build prisons. We've got a, in Victoria, there's a $750 million prison building pro program planned. Uh, they're real, real numbers. Um, in places that have been delivering communities that care for, uh, in, in re with reasonable, um, uh, fidelity, such as Pennsylvania, they're closing prison beds. They actually are closing um, their juvenile justice beds. They don't need them. The theory of change of the program is that that money that we would be spending on something that we think is a bad investment, so if we were um, talking investment strategies, uh, this is a very good thing to have in your portfolio. Mm -hmm. It can stop you having to spend that money later. Well, then the question is, are we spending enough in this community on this endeavour? And we'll be sending this message pretty um, forcefully to the federal and the state government. That's one of the, the job that I'm given. I also work uh, such that Bosco also has to get out there and we have to be, you know, we've got our mission which is to try and um, do the economic monetization and uh, convince governments that the, that big spend should be here with your community. So we, we, we're confident that the message is starting to sink in and um, if you're successful with reducing these problems by 20%, even just to show risk factor changes in two years, uh, by that stage we hope to be in a position to actually put a dollar value on that and um, to be able to point out to government what that will mean in terms of um, 
we, we can already say that uh, we think it's going to be in the ballpark of at least $5 return for every dollar that they have spent here. But we, we think we can do better than that and that the, the actual um, risk factor reduction can be monetized. To and this is where the sort of direction we're heading in. We, in the end, the vision we have is that um, you wouldn't spend money on things that are preventable, but you would spend a lot more money on a community-led coalition. So it's an important message, but we think it's the future, and uh, that's where we, we're going in our vision of what we're trying to do in partnership with you. Uh, John and Bosco, um, there is the Victorian Royal Commission into Family Violence that will be um, has commenced and uh, will be happening for a, a number of years. And I'm just wondering, would you mind commenting around how communities that care and the tools that it uses and how it may be related to um, potential uh, interventions and what we, without preempting that that's a particular issue, but it's, it certainly seems to be a particular issue from our perspective and the police's perspective, um, how, how that interrelationship, that interlinking would happen. Well, one of the, if we, I think it's probably important to begin to talk about solutions because we've talked in, in uh, generalities about the, the, what's in the kit of what you can do in the prevention strategies. So that's a field that we have students that we supervise at Deakin and uh, one of the things that we've brought in is the idea that um, in the School of Psychology now, being able to do a systematic review is core skill. Uh, every student, um, and I think in our university increasingly this is something now that is um, taking off as you know, a very important part of it. And um, uh, I know that uh, we've got so when we say, well, if we do a systematic review about what works, um, the, the evidence is there that there's actually uh, ways that you can reduce um, family conflict. And uh, the, um, the WHO um, review on what to do to reduce um, intimate partner uh, violence and family violence is uh, pointing very much to school-based social-emotional um, curricula as being not the, there's not just one answer, but it's part of the story. And it, it's not as if uh, those students go home and solve their problems at home, but they grow up. If you can actually learn some of these skills and they become um, deeply embedded in the, the reinforced by others in your community, uh, children go into relationships better skilled and then able to be assertive if you're a, um, a young woman about what you want in the relationship and to steer your man to, towards being a good partner. If you're a, a man, you can begin to talk up about problems that uh, you might be having rather than um, starting to lash out. And so that's been shown. Now, when we say it has an effect, um, I'd love to be able to say it cures all problems, but that would be a lie. It's a bit like the figures you saw with um, Mornington Peninsula. It's a, we're talking... Um, a percentage bet heading in the right direction for that risk factor. Um, <clears throat> there's some things that are very good in the international experience that are not being done in Australia. So another thing that we do is, um, I see Sharon there in, in the audience, another uh, deacon person who you've got in Warrnambool. Um, do you want to put up your hand, Sharon, so people can recognise that you've got your deacon uh, School of Psychology resources here? And there's probably many other deacon people uh, here, but um, the important thing is that evaluation of good programs that you might have seen and thought that looks like something good, uh, a, a clear message is don't abandon good things, but let's try and work together to evaluate them. One of the things we're doing with uh, Glastonbury in uh, Geelong is strengthening families program, which is, comes up in inter international literature as having very powerful effect on reducing um, violence in, uh, as people grow up. And what we've noticed there is that that's working with the most disadvantaged primary schools, uh, bringing in a program that the um, schools select the group of families that, uh, based on the child not performing that well, uh, below par in their educational outcome. And the, the program offers uh, the families an opportunity f whereby for one hour the, the parents are receiving um, skills training in core family management skills and the children are receiving them separately and then they spend an hour in family rituals together as a community um, enacting those rituals. And, I, and I've heard, um, 
I know the people that developed the program who I um, have a lot of faith in, but the program has terrific credentials in, in uh, you see the uh, children talking about, it was if the light turned on for the first time, they could suddenly get what it was like being in a family, people are eating meals together, they're learning manners, they're learning to actually take turns in who talks, and uh, we measure depression and um, the, uh, the tendency of family conflict is just dropping in those families. Now, if you can do that with a select group, um, these kids are often bullying other kids in the school and leading to reciprocal violence. Uh, so, you know, I, I get the, that we're going to evaluate the effect on the whole school, but you can imagine how much easier it is to teach in those schools. Uh, that being brought in with the very good developments with Kids Matter, which is a great social emotional curriculum. You're getting good doses for those children then in just a, a very different world that they can live in as they're growing up. So these are the hope of uh, um, an effort that can be, be, uh, begin to bring together some of these very pro promising elements. So none of it is going to solve the problems totally, but all of it is in a better direction than simply doing things that have no evidence and uh, that don't have a theory of change. So the, the unfortunate thing at the moment, there's a lot of um, responses that are not taking notice of the, the very strong prevention science data that's there of what will solve the problem. Um, the Strengthening Families program, you can, we, the data that we're getting in Australia is just so consistent with the international experience. Um, it's a very good program. Uh, this was the first time it's been available in Australia and so now we're very much promoting it and Glastonbury are quite keen on it. But there's not a funding niche by which anyone can really pick it up and uh, it's not, I'm not saying that it's, it's the right program for every environment but what we're doing through this effort is we're filling in the gaps of things that we know were very good in the international experience but were not available previously in Australia and so we want to make more of them available. And uh, so I guess that for uh, the, the critical issues that the Royal Commission is going to follow. There won't be, I'm, not, I'm sure that the spotlight won't come on these things even though I believe they offer the answers. But we'll try to put that spotlight on them as much as we can. But there are many voices and um, some speaking passionately. Um, the answers are there but you need to distill a lot, through a lot of the noise to, to get to it. And that's what we're trying to do here is shine the light on the evidence. You can do it. Um, has pe anybody heard of You Can Do It or do you do it in Warrnambool? Yeah. Uh, anyway, Michael Bernard, I think, is the professor who's been the champion for it. Um, it's, you know, he's, a, a very, he's very passionate about the program and I think he does a good job of it. And um, as far as we can work out, it's a very effective program. Um, they had a lot of training and they were very confident that this, the ones who were good at it um, did train the trainer with others. And uh, it seemed to be that from 2007 onwards, when you saw the data that uh, Bosco presented, things were starting to really dig into the harder things to change, such as antisocial behaviour. Um, so we think that uh, one of the things we want to do is to try to bring more of that um, understanding into the critical ingredients that really are the game changers. But we do think that one of them is to get a very good sort of social, emotional skills building curriculum for young people whether it be um, You Can Do It or It's Kids Matter or It's Mind Matters. It, uh, we just want to make sure it's done really well to a very high standard. The other thing they did was um, Families and Schools Together, which is a variant of strengthening families, and they were very passionate about working with agencies to get that done to a high standard. So they, when I say do it to a high standard, they bring the developers forward. Uh, we're talking, you know, one or two day trainings. Um, people are getting behind the push. Uh, you're going into the hard places to recruit the difficult families. It's that type of effort and it's not the sort of thing you can do across 20 programs, so they're just choosing two, three programs to really focus on. So it's that, that's a, an example of the sort of things they did. And um, I guess we really could draw on more on them sort of telling us a bit more about exactly what they did. But the results tended to be um, most <coughs> having most impact on the younger group. So it's the, if we look at the data for Mornington, the Year 7s are making very good progress. The Year 9s are taking longer. It's only in the more recent data that they're starting to change. And the Year 11s, we think in the future, as the Year 7s grow up, that we'll see change in the Year 11 area. So it, it does take a long time for these things to seed through. So another message is work on your young ones and, uh, and be patient about that. It doesn't mean give up on older ones. 
but the young ones are often more malleable and they're um, and it's very important though to work as a community and focus and and be able to demonstrate it that you're being successful with something because that breeds confidence and then you can uh, the sky's the limit once you get confident about this framework there's uh, Mornington have gone on now they said all right we've done all that now what's next and they're saying that they're going to uh, fix depression next and they've got a very good plan to do that so they're quite confident that they can use this for anything that they target. Uh, I've got a question. Um, how many of the programs or responses actually required um, delivery at school, whether it had been from a, say, a whole year level cohort or whether it be specific um, groups of kids withdrawn? So I guess that's a question there. But second to that would be um, if it required, you know, quite a bit of school time or withdrawal of a particular group, how did the schools marry that against the, the pressures of um, you know, a very busy curriculum? Well, the, in the evidence-based strategies guide, there are lots of programs, and you as a community will get access to that. But you can intervene in lots of areas. Like, Good Sports is one program that you can intervene in the sports setting. You know, There's strong evidence now that Good Sports does reduce alcohol consumption. Um, we've been running, Cameron introduced me as being the project director of, uh, project manager of the Smart Generation trial, which is based on the CTC framework. So what we've done there is we've worked with schools and we've inter in in integrated a curricula in the school looking at the National Health and Medical Research Council. We've also worked with families um, to, for parents, or tried to educate parents in terms of setting a rule there's evidence to show that if parents set a rule about kids not drinking before they're 18 is a really good thing and does reduce the early uptake and the consumption in adolescents. We've also done some environmental things by working with local suppliers in the community. So what we've done is we've gone around to the communities and we've done pseudo underage purchasing in those communities and uh, monitored how many shops were selling alcohol without asking for uh, proof of ID. Then we've sent letters back to these shops and these uh, traders and said, do you realise that you've got a, 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 um, a sales assistant selling alcohol without asking proof of ID? And what we found in these communities is that sending these letters by not, not laying down the law but just saying, do you realise you're breaking the law and making it easy for kids to access alcohol, that that actually reduced, when we then went again a couple of months later, substantially reduced the reduction of sales in those areas. So there are lots of areas you can intervene. It doesn't have to be in at school. It can be in setting-based. It can be family-based. It is six o'clock, so I will bring this to a close. I want to thank you all very much for coming and participating. Hearing about Communities That Care, you won't be the last you'll hear of it. And would you also please join with me in thanking John and Bosco.
say that it's the day of the day. So that was useful to hear that yeah. from you. And the other, um, the whole thing, as you know, is um, politics in its own way. Yeah. So treatment, prevention, yeah. education, yeah. policing, so. Yeah, thanks for that.